Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody, especially any visitors we have with us. We're certainly thankful that everyone is here. I'd like to remind everybody to fill out the attendance cards on the backs of the pew in front of you and then pass those to the outside aisle. They'll be collected shortly. Uh, we will begin our worship here in just a moment with the scripture reading from 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 12. Don't forget about our evening uh, worship service tonight at 5 p.m. and our regular midweek Bible study at 7 on Wednesday. Uh, we are collecting clothing items for the Children's Home in Perigold. The list are on the uh, bulletin, and these need to be new items, please. Uh, support for uh, Saul is due this week, and the Christmas party at the White's Home will be December 16th at 5 p.m. Flyers are in the foyer for that. The Arch Youth Conference is January 12th and 13th at the West End uh, Church of Christ. And on February 10th, for any adults that are interested, there will be first aid, CPR, and AED training from 9 to noon, and that'll be here. So if you're interested in learning how to use the AED or getting some uh, first aid, CPR, it's all, it's all mixed in there. Uh, or if you're interested in being the dummy for the AED, whatever you, you want to do to help us out. A um, few, few notes from our prayer list. Uh, as always, you can, you can see the full prayer list in the bulletin. Phyllis McLean and Kenny Wilcox's sister, uh, Linda Shipman, passed away yesterday evening, so please keep uh, their family in your prayers. Mamie Crape is in BJC St. Peter's, uh, broken wrist and pneumonia, uh, and they're working on that. Uh, prayers for Carl Wayne, the teacher that was shot. Uh, he's back in the hospital with an infection. Earl Whitmore had skin cancer surgery last Thursday. Uh, Amy has been sick and uh, has been in the in Mercy Hospital since a week ago, so uh, on Saturday, so keep her and family in your prayers. Uh, that's Amy Utsi. Also be aware of Lila Call, she is on hospice. Uh, Vicki Lukes, <coughs> Joni Lowry, Liz Shake, Cindy Derryberry, Ida Mitchell's grandson, John Wood, and Kay Hampton and Sue Lauderdale's friends, Joan Tunstall and Doris Tunstall, they have cancer. So there's a lot of folks to, to remember. Uh, also a bit of good news, um, Becky's son is back from Bahrain and uh, it sounds like he is, he is back to stay. He's been uh, um, in a, a place in a different area. So a lot of people to remember. Let's keep all those people in our prayer list. That's all we have for announcements, and we'll get started with our scripture reading. The scripture reading is 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 6, verses 6 through 12. And it reads, But godliness without contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and, to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Good morning, our first song this morning will be number 111. 111, we're marching to Zion. <clears throat> Complete act of the Lord.
prayer this morning will be number 456. 456, no tears in heaven. <clears throat> no tears in heaven. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you in prayer, knowing that you are our God, you are our Savior, you are our King, and all thing, good things come through you. And truly, we look forward to the day we can be in heaven where there'll be no more tears. We certainly have seen lots of tears flow during this last few weeks, and there's more to flow today. We, know, we pray for the uh, Shipman family, as well as uh, for our sisters in Christ, Phyllis and, uh, and Candy, on the loss of Linda. And certainly they're going to mourn her loss, and there'll be tears flowing for that. Same thing is true for the Fielding family with Bill's loss of his uh, sister-in-law. We've had so many recently that pass away, uh, family members and friends, and it is something that is part of life. We need to understand our mortality. We need to understand that we, those things are with us and, and it's our future. If we uh, live so long to not see your uh, son come and we need your comfort when those things happen. We need to understand uh, that you're grieving with us and, uh, and uh, uh, sorrowed at our loss but we know also that if they die as Christians, then they die with uh, the expectation that they will be in paradise and one day be with you in heaven. And that is a tremendous offering for all of us. All of us here should have that as our goal, to live righteously, to do your will, to make sure that we're going to be able to reunite it with our loved ones uh, in death as well as we have been in life. We thank you, Lord God, for the promise that there is a, to be a resurrection and that if we do your will, we can be resurrected to life and live with you always in heaven for all eternity. We pray that be the case for all that we love and hold dear. And if we have family members, we have loved ones that are not Christians, let us take the time to 
to talk to them about it and make sure that they understand the decision that they are making, that it's a conscious one, that they're making not to be with you in heaven. We pray for all here this morning uh, that we will be there. And for those that are in our audience this morning have not yet responded to the gospel, uh, this is our prayer, that, that you will. That uh, something will be said today that will make you understand that it's time for you to uh, repent and, and uh, come forward to declaring Jesus Christ as Lord and be baptized uh, into Jesus' death so that you can be raised as he was in his resurrection to a new creature walking in, in the light. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunities we have like this to gather together. Uh, we know that we're here to worship you, and that is our focus, that is our, our purpose. But it was also we're here to encourage each other, to, uh, to be encouraged, to share in uh, many things concerning this worship service and the practices that we will go through, including the Lord's Supper. And we pray that uh, you will do so with the right mind, the right, the right thoughts, and the right attitude. We uh, thank you for those who have been healed and are getting better, but we know there's so many on our prayer list that are not at this point uh, return to good health. We pray you're with them and that, that they will be ministered to and things will improve in their lives. We, uh, we thank you for loving us and, and uh, providing us so much in the way of uh, medical help these days. And we know there's more to come in the future. We pray for our families. We, uh, for this time of the year, it's a family time, uh, getting together and enjoying the holidays. And let us make sure that as we do all of our celebrations that you are part of it, that we give thanks to you for all the blessings that come from you. We thank you for watching over this country. We pray that uh, the, the things that we see in our country that are detrimental, things that are destroying this fabric, will, uh, will change and uh, we will return to a, a better people, a more moral people, a people that look to you for guidance. We pray that it be so for our nation, for our leaders, that uh, they will turn to you and, and look to you to see what is right. Be with our military people. Uh, it's particularly difficult if they're deployed overseas or in areas of, of danger to be there during the holidays when they're apart from their loved ones. Watch over them and keep them safe. Help us each day, O oh Lord, to think of others and to make sure that we're uh, in our prayer life, uh, being thankful for the things we have and being uh, supportive of others and encouraging others and uh, praying for their, for their uh, salvation. Each and every day, O oh Lord, we need to come to you asking for forgiveness. Each day, O oh Lord, we need to come to you in thanks. Any day, O oh Lord, we need to come and tell you how much we love you. These things we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Next song this morning is number 843. What's displayed on the screen may be a little bit different in your book, so we'll sing with what's on the screen. 843, as the deer. <clears throat> as the deer.
the imitation song. That will be number 31 after Brother Jerry's lesson. The song before it, the lesson will be in number 738. We will glorify the King of Kings. If you would please stand to the song if you're willing and able. We'll sing uh, 738 before the lesson. <coughs> We forgot What a beautiful gift God has given to each one of us by our very lives that he has blessed us with. And it is a precious gift from God. And we ought to be thankful, certainly, for, for life itself. Even though life, we know, is problem-filled, we know that life is passing. And we see that and understand that every day that we are still living. But also we understand that this life that God has given to us is the time in which we are to spend in preparation. Life is short. It's as a vapor that appears a little time and then vanisheth away. And so the opportunities we have are certainly limited by the fact that our time is limited here upon this earth. The Apostle Paul was so fond of this young man, Timothy. He wrote two letters to Timothy, encouraging him. And reminding him of some things that certainly God desired for him to do. And Paul reminded uh, young Timothy, who he refers to as his son in the faith. He reminds young Timothy of the responsibility that he has. And certainly in carrying out. God's will. And the same thing that he writes to young Timothy and in his encouraging words and reminding him of his responsibilities in reference to certainly the souls of others, but also in reference to his own soul. 
is the same thing that God, through the Apostle Paul, is reminding us as well. In that section of our scripture reading this morning, found in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, Paul says, <clears throat> Flee these things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Our focus in our study this morning will basically be there in this section of Scripture. And as we look at that section, verses 11 and 12 of 1 Timothy chapter 6, we will note four things. Paul reminds Timothy that there is something that he is to firmly grip. When Paul says in verse 12, lay hold, that means to catch, that means to firmly grip. Don't let go of, but to firmly grip. Secondly, Paul says uh, to Timothy that uh, there is something that he is to flee. Number three, he says to Timothy, there is something he is to follow. And then in, also in verse 12, he says to Timothy, he is to, to fight. When you look at these four things, These are four things that Paul is admonishing of Timothy. These are not optional matters. In reference to making sure that a person is prepared as he should be to please God. Now, when I just said these things are not optional matters, you understand that by the very fact that these are admonitions, these are directives, these are commands, that we do have an option. We can choose to do this, or we can choose not to do this. There is an option in that sense. But these things are not optional. These things are an obligation if we're going to be prepared, certainly, to, to please God. As we focus, at least begin to focus on these four things, Let's look at what Paul says there in verse 12 where he says to lay hold. That is, firmly grip. When you look at that, notice the object that is to be firmly gripped. That is, to lay hold on. There is something and Paul says that you are to firmly grip, you are to lay hold on. Now we know in the Bible, in different sections of Scripture, you will read about things that we are to put on. And then Paul would talk about things that we are to put off. 
For example, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul emphasizes to us in verse 19 to 21, here are things that we are not to participate in. But then beginning verse 22 through 23, Paul reminds us here are things that we are to put into our life. So Paul does that in many of his writings. In other words, there are things that we are to exclude from our life, and there are things that we are to embrace. And when we embrace those good and right things, we are not to let go of those things. Remember in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21, Paul says, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. So when he says to hold fast to that which is good, he's also saying, don't let go of it. Hold on to it. And so here in this passage, Paul says to lay hold, to firmly grip. Now the object of that, of course, is that of eternal life. He's not just talking about any kind of life. Now, we have life now. We have physical life now. We understand that. Which God has blessed each one of us with. But then we know that in the Scripture, there is that which is referred to as being eternal life, or life eternal. And it is that which Paul says to Timothy that you are to firmly grip, that you are to lay hold on. You remember Matthew 19, a rich, young ruler came running to Jesus. And when you look at that passage in Matthew 19 and the parallel passages to that, we know that when this young man came running to Jesus, when he got there, he knelt before him, showing respect and reverence for the Lord. And when he knelt before the Lord, he said to Jesus, Good Master, what shall I do to have eternal life? And so this young man desired to lay hold on to firmly grip, if you will, eternal life. You recall the account. The Lord told him what he needed to do. But you also remember that after the Lord told him that he needed to go and sell what he had and give to the poor, then come and follow me, the young man went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Now he had a desire for that of, to know how he could have, from the grip, eternal life. But the demands, as the Lord laid out for this young man, was such that the young man did not want to do that. Just because an individual desires to have eternal life does not mean that that desire in of itself, that through that desire in of itself, that a person has laid hold on to it. It doesn't happen. Now, desire is important. Desire is essential, because if a person doesn't desire eternal life, he is not going to lay hold on to it. It's not going to happen. So the desire has to be there. In Matthew chapter 25, 
We have in the latter part of Matthew 25 a picture of the judgment scene. And how people are going to be separated at the judgment day. And in verse 46, he says, But these, talking about the unrighteous, but these shall go into eternal punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. In John chapter 5, we have here Jesus giving forth proof that he was the Son of God. And his evidence was that he presented to those people was, look at John the Baptist. Look at what he proclaimed in reference to Jesus. Jesus says, look at my father. Look at what he proclaimed. Jesus said, look at my works that I did. And when he talks about works there, no doubt having reference to his miraculous works. And then in verse 39, John chapter 5, Jesus says, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have life, and they are that which testifieth of me. And so Jesus said, Here's the evidence that I am the Son of God. And he referenced even the Scripture itself. That's verse 39. But then in verse 40, he said, And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. Remember John 10 and verse 10. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. John 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Paul says to Timothy, here's something I want you to lay hold on. If you're going to really prepare yourself as you ought to prepare yourself to please God, then you've got to lay hold on. You've got to firmly grip life eternal. If you do that, it will change your life as you are now living. But when we look at Titus chapter 2, verse 1, Titus 3 and verse 7, Paul says in both of those verses, when we talk about eternal life, he says, in hope of eternal life. You see, eternal life is a promise. 1 John chapter 2, 25 through 28. It is a promise. It's a promise. We don't have it in actuality now. But we live in hope of life eternal. It is that which the Apostle Paul spoke of when he wrote, and when he, as he wrote 2 Timothy chapter 4, understanding that his life was soon about to end, he knew death was imminent. So Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 6, For I'm not ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. For I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is later for me 
a crown of righteousness. Eternal life or life eternal is the same as that crown of righteousness. Revelation 2 and verse 10. You know the verse. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. A crown of life. That crown of life is the same as crown of righteousness. That crown of life, the crown of righteousness, is the same as eternal life. And therefore, as one who is a child of God, we live in hope of eternal life. And so when Paul says to Timothy, firmly grip, well, the object of that was eternal life. But notice, the one he describes as doing this. Verse 11, he says, But thou, O man of God, then we see these four admonitions. Flee, follow, fight, firmly grip. Notice that phrase, man of God. That phrase is used in the Old Testament to refer to Moses in Deuteronomy 33 in verse 1. It is used in the Old Testament to refer to Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 6. It's not a phrase often used in Scripture. But God used that phrase in reference to Moses and to Samuel. And here in the New Testament, we find that phrase used in reference to Timothy. And so when it says, but thou old man of God, so he's describing Timothy here as a man of God. I know 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 15. Paul says, But thou from a child hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, complete, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Now again, it is used in reference to Timothy in the, the context there. But understand, please, when Paul says here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, but thou, O man of God, if you want to be a man of God, he says, here's what you need to do. You need to flee, follow, fight, firmly grip. Light of eternal life. So I said, well, I, I can't be a man of God. I cannot be a person of God. What do you mean you can't be? If I cannot be a child of God, a person of God, if you will, 
then why should I even be reading any of this? Why should I even be concerned with any of this? If we were to describe the man of God today, we're using that word man in a generic sense, who would that person be today? Well, it would have to be, first of all, that for a person to be a man of God, that he must be born again. John 3, verse 3 and verse 5. Does not that make sense? A person must be born of water and the Spirit. And so if we want to be a man of God today, then we've got to be born again. A man of God is one who belongs to He belongs to God. He belongs to the Lord. What? Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. First Timothy chapter 6, 19 through 20. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying you don't belong to yourself. You belong to God. To the Lord. That's who you belong to. Well, who are those who belong to the Lord? Who is this letter addressed to? It is addressed to the saints at Corinth. A man of God is one who has been bought. He has been bought. We have been redeemed not by corruptible things such as silver and gold, 1 Peter 1, 18, but it's by the blood of Jesus. And so we have been bought. We have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. So we don't belong to ourselves. We belong to him. And therefore, when that happened, we were born again. We became a man of God. A man of God is one who believes. Believes in the sense, not just a mental assent, but he believes from the standpoint that he trusts and he obeys. That's the man of God. As those people in Hebrews chapter 11. And the man of God is one who behaves. Because he understands that as he lives his life, it is to be done to glorify God. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. Paul says, firmly gripped. What? Eternal life. Who is to do that? The man of God. Number three. We know here firmly gripped. No one knows the object of that. Eternal life. We know it's the one that is to do that. The man of God. But, and we'll conclude with this. When we talk about firmly gripping, if you will, that of eternal life by the man of God, Paul then reminds him as he reminds us. We have an obligation. 
we have an obligation. And we're con we will continue to look at that this evening. And so we see here in this passage, in this section, where Paul talks about we are to firmly grip eternal life. A part of that is that we are to flee certain things, we are to follow after certain things, and we are to fight, he says, that good fight of faith. This morning, as Jamie is about to lead us in this song, how do you stand with God this morning? Are you preparing yourself as you should prepare yourself in the life that you now have, the life that God has blessed you with? I can't wait I have to do something now. And all these admonitions here, the thought behind each one of them is here's what you need to do and do it now. And also the ideal here is they all four are continual action. It's not like, okay, whoop, I grabbed hold of eternal life today. I've got it. Forget about it. No. It's a continual thing. Okay, I have fled from some things today, which is good. So I, I'm through with that until next year. No. It's continual action. All four of these things. Demands that we not be passive in the way in which we live. Flee, follow, fight, firmly grip. Are you doing that? We can't lay hold on eternal life unless we are man of God or child of God. So this morning, if you're not a child of God, if you don't have that promise, if you don't have that hope of eternal life, let's do something about that this morning. We have the time and opportunity to do something about it. Having heard the, certainly the truth, we encourage you to believe. That belief ought to lead us to repent of our sins, turn from them to confess Christ and to be baptized for the remission of our sins. That's how we can become a child of God. Having all spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1 and verse 3, and one of those blessings is the hope of eternal life. That's living with desire and expectation based upon the promises of God. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, why not do that this morning? If you are the child of God, that you have stopped fleeing, following, fighting, and firmly holding on to eternal life. Well, if you stopped, then well, we need to correct that. We need to do something about that this morning. But we can't stop doing any four of those things and expect to be prepared to meet God and to hear the words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Remember, please, he's not going to say, well done, thy good and faithful quitter. If you need to respond, why not do so? As together we stand. That's the same.
before we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning will be number 726. 726, we saw thee not. <clears throat> We saw thee not. the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. With this in mind, let us pray for the bread. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. We thank you for sending your Son, Jesus, down on the earth, on the cross, to die for our sins, so that we may be able to have a hope of heaven. Dear Lord, we pray that you will allow us to remember Christ's body as he hung on the cross, which is represented by the bread, and we pray that you will and we pray that we will partake of it in a manner pleasing in thy eyesight. Dear Lord, we pray that we will also look forward to your son's second coming and make sure that we are right when that time comes. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord, we do again thank you for this day, another opportunity to come here to worship in spirit and truth. Pray that we take this time, Lord, to examine ourselves according to things that have been said here. We take this in a manner pleasing in thy sight. It's in Christ's name that we ask these things. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper at this time, but the elders have set aside this time for us to give back to, uh, as God has prospered us. With this in mind, let us go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our God and our Father, we humbly approach our throne at this time. Thank you, Father, for all that thou has done and all that thou will continue to do for us. Father, we know that it's because of thee that we live, breathe, and have our own being. And Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity that you have afforded us to I give back a portion that you have so graciously blessed us with. Father, we pray that we, as we prepare to give, that we would do so in a manner that would be cheerful and pleasing unto thee. And Father, we pray that this often be used to expand the borders of thy kingdom. These are all blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Closing song this morning will be number 523 in our guide. He is alive. If you're willing and able, if you would please stand for this song and remain standing for our closing prayer. 523. We'll sing the first, second, and last stanza. <clears throat> there is beyond the end.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to meet here and study your word, sing songs of praise to you. Father, we thank you for the lesson that Jerry brought us. We thank you for your word and the direction it gives us and uh, that we know what your will is for us. Father, we pray that you would give us the strength and desire to fight the good fight of faith so that we may hold, lay hold of eternal life. Father, we thank you for Jesus and his willingness to sacrifice himself for us. And Father, we pray again for those of our number who are sick, who are undergoing treatments. We pray for those ministering to them. Father, we pray for those who have lost loved ones recently, that you would comfort them. And Father, we pray for our men and women in the military and those who are in harm's way. We pray that you would watch over and protect them. Father, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins when we repent and turn from them. And Father, go with us, watch over us, and protect us now until this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>